And I can see her mouth the words, that's him, that's the guy. As she's pointing to me, letting her friends know that I'm the guy that wrote this note to her and handed it to her. Mm -hmm. And her friends all turned their head at me and it seemed like slow motion. And they all erupted in just the shrill sound of high school girls laughing, mm -hmm. laughing at me. And my heart literally jumped out of my chest and fell on the floor and broke into a thousand pieces. So <laughs> that was one of my deepest traumatic wounds. That's a clip from this interview that I did with my friend Antonio talking about rejection. I guess it's a kind of universal experience for a lot of people. And it was kind of interesting with this interview because we were in San Miguel de Allende celebrating a friend's birthday. I wanted to interview Antonio, but I didn't know about what. He heard about the cognitive behavioral techniques that I've been working with. And we kind of combined that interview and the cognitive behavioral techniques. So this will be interesting for people because you get a, an idea of how a cognitive behavioral session works. You can also see how we go about extracting wisdom from our own experience and gaining insight, asking questions about how we can integrate things. Like perhaps if we think two things are irreconcilable, it might turn out that there might be a way that we can get both of those things moving forward once we start to imagine them. Talking to Antonio the other day, discussing this interview, of course, he said he was holding back a little bit during the interview, which is understandable. Of course, when something's being recorded, you're going to second guess occasionally. Even so, you probably notice how open he is in this interview. Beforehand, I remember thinking, oh, can I really help this guy? He seems like such a, a well-rounded person. Are we going to discover some opportunities. And as you listen to the interview, maybe you'll notice how we start to find problems and how quickly there can actually seem to be opportunities in order to move towards a life of greater fulfillment. So if you are interested in a cognitive behavioral session, I'll tell you a bit more about that after the interview. Let's begin. So, Antonio, I want to tell you a little about how cognitive behavioral therapy works. So, you have an idea, maybe we can explore some of these techniques or <laughs> try to give you some perspective on a situation in your life. Mm -hmm. Or maybe you can find an opportunity that you didn't know that was there how to look mm. at things in a, in a more positive way or something like that. Normally, the way it goes, this, the structure of it, something like this, it comes from uh, this book called The Skilled Helper by Jared Egan. Mm -hmm. And he has these four key questions. Mm -hmm. And they're like, what's on your mind? What is the real challenge? Uh, what do you want? Mm -hmm. And what can you do about it? Mm -hmm. and it's like we start formulating okay. a plan. So is there anything, like, is there a problem that's, that's been going through your mind, something that's worrying you, or some new project that you're embarking on? Hmm. Well, the conundrum as of late with myself and the extended community that I'm involved with seems to be around the question of where to be in the world right now, as far oh. as where to live, because things are so in flux and the state of the world is very volatile. Yeah. So there's a lot of desire from myself and other community members within my circle to investigate and ponder that question deeply. Where yeah. is it that we want to be in the world? And also individually for myself. Yeah. So that's the most important question, of course, because it always comes back to the individual. So for me, myself and I, I ask myself that and of course is also in tandem with spirit where is source and spirit guiding me to be to mm. do my work so i'm looking at my own desires where ideally i'd like to be and 
not necessarily that that matches or needs to align with spirit because ultimately it's, it's up to spirit where I'm at. So, <laughs> yeah. So there's the desire for my, myself to be in Oaxaca or someplace very green, very lush and thriving with a lot of plants and flora and fauna and also close to water, close to the ocean. So that's kind of an arbitrary question of what's going on <laughs> right now for me because it's neither, nothing is concrete. Yeah. So on a deeper level of what's on my mind or okay. is there anything that's concerning or, or worrying me? Hmm. I have to say no on one level. I get it. <laughs> <laughs> because on the deepest level, everything is good, all is well. I'm content. Yes. But then on another level... It's probably a very common theme running around right now in many circles of where are we going to, how are we going to be working? How are we going to be making an income yeah. now that we're moving forward from this point where we are after COVID-19? Hmm. And the arrows seem to point very strongly toward e-commerce mm -hmm. and cyber currency. Mm -hmm. So... For my next step of my journey, I'm looking at revamping my old um, branding almost because I was marketed as a yoga teacher, teaching meditation, mm -hmm. sound baths, some psilocybin journeys, mm -hmm. and these things. And even though I think that's what I want to do still, I don't want to teach groups in that dynamic. I definitely don't want to teach online groups. So mm -hmm. I want to work one-on-one -on -one with people doing sound activation, voice activation, doing chanting, giving sound baths, and working on a book. So that's my main narrow laser focus right now. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> okay. All right. This is, it's kind of a lot of things. So, yeah. so all right. So there's a question of where, where you want to live and where, where people like your, your family or your tribe want yeah. to live. And then there's a question of how you're going to support yourself in, mm -hmm. in the future mm -hmm. and, and what that looks like. Right. But behind that, there's really no fear, worry, yes. or anxiety, yeah. which is a beautiful thing. It's just, okay, this is where we're at. And I'm not going to stress about it because the unfolding is happening. Yeah. And I have to trust that it's going to unfold in its own time frame and not to push it because I can't. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, this is a good, you know, the great thing about where you're at because you, you're not really worried or anxious about anything. But you just, sometimes uh, we have things that 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 aren't obvious to us, and sometimes they're like opportunities mm -hmm. just just out of sight, and and uh, with some reflection we can discover them. So right. uh, hopefully we will in this conversation. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so which do you think is the more pressing? Which is more important at the moment, the, hmm. the location or the occupation? Hmm. That's or a good question. Else. You know, because of the, at the essence of my being, there is a little bit of mild, not conflict, but a bit of a conundrum. Hmm. Because, oh, you get to a certain point in life and you feel like you want to have roots somewhere. Hmm. If you grow up with a family or a family dynamic and it was more functional than dysfunctional, mm -hmm. there's a part of us, I think, that desires that familial bond or familial unit. So there's a part of me that at this point in my life, I've, I've been here on the planet for decades now, and there's a part of me that would like to have some kind of family and feel that nurturing environment of a family. Mm -hmm. But however, there's more bigger things in the picture that I need to allow to come to fruition I feel mm. so this is something that I don't know if it's a cultural societal thing that is kind of pressurized a little bit you know family you mm. want a family you should have a family <laughs> mm. but at the same time like I said if you grow up with a healthy family loving family environment mm. there's I feel like a part um, I can only speak for myself but there's a part of me that enjoys being around that family dynamic because it's what I had growing up uh, but at the same time I love my freedom I love being able to do what I want when I want And yes. not having to worry about obligations with other people within that dynamic. So there's yes. a mild conundrum, not conflict, but a mild conundrum. So that feeds into the pressing of where to be in the world because there is the desire to plant some roots and be somewhat stable. 
because we live right now in a really unstable time. Hmm. So perhaps it's feeding into that desire to find some stability. Hmm. And on the other front of work and career, that seems pressing because I'm a little bit behind the curve as far as cyber currency Hmm. and being on top of that world Mm -hmm. and being in e-commerce and really making a go of it. So I'm a little bit behind the curve of that. So I feel like that's more pressing than where to be. Okay. Well, let, let me ask you this, though. So now we, now we have these three things like the fa- family, location, yeah. and, and occupation. And <clears throat> if, from, from one perspective, we could look at this and, and say the location and the occupation are, are only means to have a stable family life. Now, would that be the case for you or, or that's not quite how your values are aligned? They're only means to have a stable family life. Yes, because and occupation. yes, because if you if uh, if you know where you live, you know uh, you have a stable place to live, mm-hmm. and you have a, a stable occupation or more or less stable, mm-hmm. uh, then you can support a family. Right, and it's it sounds like having a family is is something. Uh, maybe it's not the most important thing to you, but it's something that's on your mind. Mm-hmm. So. Would those things be serving your family life or would mm. they be? Yeah, they would. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. They go hand in hand with that kind of lifestyle choice. Hmm. Yeah. Career, so, location. I would ideally be mobile. I wouldn't have to be in an office or at a, mm-hmm. any other location. I could be from home or wherever I choose. So it would be very ideal. I could be home and also be attentive and be present for the needs of my mate, partner, family and all that. Hmm. So it, it does seem to fit the ideal of location hmm. and then allowing that with my work to unfold wherever that might go with a potential mate or friend or and or family hmm. <clears throat> okay so f- is family like having having a loving raising a loving family like that is mm-hmm. is that uh, that sort of well not the most maybe not the most important thing to you but is is that a very high priority for you no no Okay. <laughs> in yeah. a dream world in a dream world it's, it's nice to i think all, a lot of, a lot of people enjoy what the other side has yes it's yes. always nicer the grass is greener on the other side yes kind of thing so i'd love to see loving families and see it, that dynamic and and just feel that that unit that family unit mm-hmm. bound by an unconditional love or bound by some deep love there's something to be said for that. So on one level, there is almost like the fly in the wall mm-hmm. that wants to absorb that through osmosis and live that life. Mm-hmm. But there's the free spirit that doesn't want to, well, it's all projection. This yes. idea that I'm going to be tied down or that I'm going to be having to compromise my lifestyle okay. or all of, all of these things play into it. And it could ultimately go back to a deep embedded fear of, you know, being with somebody for a, a, a lifelong partner commitment. Yeah, yeah, it, it could be a fear. Yeah. It could also be that you value your independence very highly. Could be that too, yeah. Yes, yes. So what if there were a way where you could experience that kind of contribution of a family mm-hmm. uh, without giving up, giving up too much of your independence. Right. How, what would that look like? Well, it would look like almost similar to life in a kibbutz. Ah. Where the children were raised by the village. Hmm. And as the saying goes, it takes a village to raise a child. Yes. Yeah. So I actually like that model or model hmm. of how to raise a family or how to raise a, a children in a communal environment. Because there's so much pressure on two people to raise a child or children, plus trying to manage a relationship and bring harmony into that and also balancing career and work Hmm. and all of these things bring a a huge level of stress and anxiety into that relationship uh, between two people Hmm. when they have the children so I don't foresee myself having children unless there is some kind of support system so all that pressure doesn't fall on my partner and myself Hmm. and we end up hating each other after a few years or or, um, yeah, worst case scenario. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's kind of interesting because you seem you seem to be saying that you were raised in in a very yeah. loving home. Yeah, there's yeah. a little dichotomy but, there. <laughs> yes, you you seem to have these uh, the these worries or these I don't know these ideas that mm-hmm. that things 
might not be loving, I suppose, in, in a family environment. I don't know if it's loving is the right word. Yeah. I, I feel it's that I've been conditioned, perhaps, to living my life a certain way. After mm-hmm. four decades, you just get used to not having a partner, not having a wife. I have a, a partner, but there's we're not married and we're not even engaged. Mm-hmm. And so um, I've always felt like I'm a strange bird when it comes to marriage and, and that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Because it's true. Um, I think part of it is because of the culture and the indoctrination through movies, books of this I- idealized romance mm-hmm. that people tend to get locked into this fantasy world of how a romance or a, a loving relationship is supposed to look based mm-hmm. on Hollywood and movies and all that jazz. Mm-hmm. And there is part of that that's been embedded in my psyche. But there's also... So it's interesting, I, I, you know... I'm not sure how much of it is the indoctrination from culture and how much of it is the true desire to have a reciprocating, loving unity within that family dynamic. So so there is a, a, almost like a push and pull, and, mm-hmm. but it's not a conflict where I'm, I'm really twisted and torn that keeps me up at night and keeps me in knots and, sure. and I can't live my life. It's not like that, but yeah. it's enough that I'm aware of it. I'm aware that there is this desire for this family thing. And then there's this other desire to push away and reject it. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So it's a, it's an interesting conundrum. Yeah. Well, it does seem like you're a very happy guy and it probably seems like whatever decision you go with, you you probably find a way to make the most of it and, and yeah. enjoy it a yeah. lot. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's not, yeah. Like you said, it's kind of, it's kind of, it's not even a problem, but, yeah. but it is like a, it's an opportunity to be more fulfilled if you if you can find those circumstances that are, right. that are best for you. Right, yeah. right, and I think that's what it comes down to. Is my last relationship? I was with this young woman, and it was a very brief but fiery relationship, hmm. and she brought a lot of anxiety and stress into the relationship, and. Uh, she's a little bit younger than me, a few years, but from that experience, just from having this dance of these two spirits, she and I, um, for some months, I realized from her anxiety that she was bringing, she brought a lot of anxiety to the relationship. I realized that I wasn't willing to commit to somebody who hasn't done, or I don't want to say hasn't done, but isn't at that place where they really are emitting and vibrating and being Mm. that kind of tranquil, peaceful person, because Mm. I am. And so when I take in a new energy in my life, it can upset or disrupt this lifestyle that I have or this way of being that I have. And it almost feels like there's not a compromise for me Mm. at this point, because I've done the dance before with previous relationships and I'm not willing to go back and revisit those old past wounds and for me, it's like repeating the same chapter instead of starting a new chapter, moving forward. I don't want to. I don't want to be in a relationship with somebody unless they have done enough work where they can be okay with just quiet solitude and also stressful situations. But mm. everybody handles stressful situations differently. Mm. So it, it, it all comes down to, I guess, the particular person <laughs> and how compatible they are. Okay. Yeah, it w- I mean, it would occur to me to to think, and I don't know if this is true, but I, I'm, I would wonder if your standards are too high. Uh-huh. <laughs> like, you know, you can never meet the perfect person. Yeah. But is is that relevant or do you, you don't uh, think that's a factor? Uh, you know, I would like to say no, but reality is I think I do have too high standards. Hmm. Yeah. But at the same time, I don't. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> okay. for... When it comes to um, a lifelong commitment, life partner, Mm -hmm. I've got very high standards. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. uh, Yeah. There is no but. Okay. Yeah. I do have high standards. Yeah. But at the same time, I'm not judgmental and I'm very accepting of people. Hmm. Yeah. 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 Well, is it like it's a... 
a big division like in, in your in your friendships and even maybe with your lovers you're very accepting and non judgmental but that but then when it comes to like oh is this person going to be with me for a really long time maybe then you you start creeping up <laughs> stakes are higher <laughs> yes. yes you're yes. leaving all the lids off the jars and this is okay for you <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, these are the things I, I I can't live with that. I'm sorry. These are pet peeves that just add up. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Well, it's, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, there's a lot of cultural differences. Uh, it depends, depends where you live to different, yeah. different countries. A lot of uh, men these days seek women in like Latin America because they're, you know, subservient. They well, yeah, I mean, that's one way to look at it. It's probably, you know, it's definitely a factor. It also, like, the homemakers are mm-hmm. a lot of, mm-hmm. like, in the United States or something. It's not like that. Yeah, they're very traditional here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah well, let's, let's, uh, okay, let's try to tie this in a bit. So we have, like, the, the, the location, the occupation, the uh, perhaps a, a vision of a, of a loving family. Perhaps uh, you know this this vision of continued independence, mm-hmm. maybe not being in a lifelong partnership or not mm-hmm. raising a family, right? And and then the the, uh, the difficulty of finding a a, a great partner mm-hmm. is, is also a, a, a thing there. Which do you think? What would you say the the real challenges, or what what would you okay. uh, say is the most important out of these things? Well, most important out of these things was it brings me back to. Uh, commitment I made about four years ago. Hmm. <clears throat> about four years ago, I, I made a commitment to spirit. I put a commitment out to spirit and spirit can be on par with source, mm-hmm. you know, whatever you, you want to align with spirit, source, God. Yep. I made a commitment to be a vessel of service to be used for healing myself and others in this mm-hmm. world. And so I made a commitment first to spirit and source. So all of my other relationships nothing came to nothing could interfere or compete with that commitment that I had made because that okay. was to me the foundation of my being yeah. you know, to be with spirit, to be on this path of healing and helping mm-hmm. each other and myself and the planet. So that's the most important thing. And it still feels the most important thing because I do feel that I do have a capacity to hold space to, to help people work through some challenges that they have in their life. But it makes also for the path to be a little bit lonesome sometimes. Mm. Well, that's a bit of a conundrum because we're never truly alone. I mean, we've always got nature and birds and mm. we've got family, hopefully, and a circle of friends. And so we're never truly alone. But it, it does also remind me that there's some seeds that get planted within the psyche that create this feeling of loneliness mm. and that can lead to desperation. Sometimes if that loneliness extends for quite some time, that feeling of loneliness. And I'm not going there, but I do recognize that humans have this capacity to go into depression when mm-hmm. they feel that their loneliness or that they're alone. So hold, hold on. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm not sure if I've understood entirely. Are you saying that because of your path as a healer, yeah. it, it can be very solitary yeah. because it's, it's you've taken this grand responsibility of a of, uh, well, of almost of everyone, of, right. of, of helping right. other people. Right. Yeah. Okay, I see. Yeah, so that can lead to feelings of loneliness. Yeah. Because you're committed first to the path and to that commitment to spirit and source. And then hmm. you find these other beautiful spirits along the way. And as much as I enjoy dancing within the dynamic of relationships and romance, I also know that they can be draining emotionally. So hmm. if I'm going to be committed to the path of harnessing my energy to help be of service to others and myself, then I really need to be mindful of how I expend and share my energy. Hmm. So that's why that's a, a big reason why I'm I'm very particular about who I choose to be involved with. Yeah. And I think most of us should be because we don't want to have a draining relationship. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. Yeah. Seek uh, mutually beneficial mm-hmm. relationships. Is this, mm, this is a, a conflict because you 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 want to have your path and then 
maybe you you also want to share your life with somebody. Is that right? The right. Key, it is the it real is. challenge. Yeah, it is a bit because when you're committed to that path of, of spirituality and of service, that's the path, and it's a very fulfilling and rewarding path. But then it's a path of spirit and in the astral and ethereal. Mm. But yet we're humans, you know, and yes. we're spirits embodying the human form. So we want to have, we're social creatures. We want to have these kind of dynamics and relationships that are enriching for us and give us meaning. Mm. So I long for these deep social connections and meaningful connections. And I've been blessed to have many, but I don't want to feel like I'm compromising. Mm -hmm. If I'm committed to something very profound and deep to me, I don't want to have something that feels superficial mm -hmm. at the same time. You know, I want to have something that's really going to dig roots into what I'm co-creating with somebody. Mm. I'll, I'll tell you something. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. We'll see if this is relevant. Mm -hmm. But I had, uh, I was sitting in meditation some months ago, and I guess the something came up which made me it's like a little itch in my mind mm -hmm. and it eventually got got to this revelation and it was like listen Kurt the reason that you've never had a very long term relationship like longer than a year is actually because you believe that you're not worthy of deep deep love and that you're not capable of deep deep love Mm -hmm. and you are mm -hmm. worthy and you you are capable right and i was like whoa okay maybe <laughs> uh <-huh>. that <laughs> that might be a, an important point yeah do, do you think that's relevant to you i think at one time it was mm. i think at one time it was because my childhood was was very uh, it was challenging in a lot of ways being a minority and, and being mm. affected by racism and prejudices placed upon me and projected at me, perhaps. Um, so I had to go through that because if you are discriminated or ridiculed and humiliated, there is an immediate sense of self-worth diminished. Yeah. So I did a lot of work to look at that and really move into a space of acceptance and, and self-love and self-care mm. early on. So... I don't feel that is the case. Yeah. However, I can empathize with your statement because I mm. haven't had many long-term relationships. Right. The longest relationship I've had is about three and a half years. Hmm. And I'm okay with that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm really okay with that because people grow, people change. And I look at these are the relationships that I'm familiar with, with friends and family. And these people were married in their early 20s. And they changed so much after 20 years. And they're still together. These are couples that are still together after 20 mm. years. And I see such drastic changes in who these people were and who they are now that I always felt like when I was young that young women and girls my age wanted to get married and have children and do that whole family dynamic and, and settle down and do that thing. Mm. And for me, even when I was a young teenager, I knew that that wasn't the path for me. I knew that I wanted to experience things. I wanted to travel. I wanted to experience life. I wanted to understand how this all works. And I'll never know fully. No, <laughs> none of us will. But at least I knew at an early age I wanted to experience life. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> so for me, there, there was a period of I went through the lack of self-worth, diminished self, and... I'm full of self-love. And mm. I think that might be part of the conundrum that I'm discovering mm. is that we each have our own idea and concept of what love is based on the role models that we had growing up. And fortunately, I had two very loving, well, I had, I had a very loving family. My father and I had problems growing up, as most fathers and sons did. Mm. My mother, on the other hand, just showered me with affection and love. And perhaps this is where this might be unfolding in, in my choosing being uber selective because my mother being this mm. wonderful matriarchal uh, figure in, in the house was very loving, very, very doting and very affectionate. And, and there's a, uh, uh, perhaps there's a part in all of us, but I feel like there's a, there's, there's the idea that we want to be 
adored and loved. Each of us wants this. We mm-hmm. desire to be loved. We desire to some extent to be adored, I really feel. Mm-hmm. And it's not so much that I'm desiring the adoration because I know that's just having the ego stroked, but mm-hmm. maybe. Could be. Yeah. yeah. It could be, you know, it could be something deeper. Could be like, you know, like worshiping each other, like, <laughs> like for truly <laughs> believing in each other, you know. Right. Well, like yeah. That. Well, maybe that's where I'm going with that because I really mm-hmm. want to have that kind of level of commitment. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, I know that we're individuals. I mean, this is, a, it's just an insane world where we're creative, unique individual people and we come together and decide to compromise our own desires and some of our goals and interests to get mm-hmm. together and try to make this cohesive relationship thing work. Mm-hmm. So I understand that there's a lot of compromise and, and desire to really find somebody who meshes rather than oil and water who don't mix. Mm-hmm. You know? right. Well, let's, let's try this. So it's like we, we have this idea of like you're, you're on your path and, and maybe meaning someone to, to share your life with mm-hmm. would actually be, it, it almost seems like you see it as a, a detour from that path. Mm-hmm. And so, so it's like these, these two seem irreconcilable. Right. But what, it, what would it look like if you had somebody who, who would share your path yeah. with you? If, yeah. if these two things could be reconciled, what would that look like? What would it feel like, smell like, uh, sound like? Yeah, I think it would just, it would look like confetti flying. <laughs> like a wedding yeah well um, yeah or a party or celebration uh-huh. <laughs> a celebration yeah. every celebration day. Of, of two spirits coming together and and really understanding what their hearts want and aligning those desires in the deepest way with their mind hmm. as well and then it would just be a big dance of play because our spirits would be dancing and playing hmm. but it would look like um, a very light relationship i mean I'm not afraid of, of heavy stuff, of getting sticky, because I know that's really where where things can really manifest mm-hmm. in a relationship. When you go through that, that dark, sticky stuff together, you can really become quite a powerful unit. Mm. So I'm not afraid of going through anything dark or, or heavy with somebody. But at the same time, a relationship that it, I feel would be really uh, synchronistic and compatible mm. would be full of harmony. Mm-hmm. Or maybe I'm projecting an ideal, but it seems like that could be a very feasible possibility. You know? So, so, it, so would it, it would be, look very fun. Yeah. It would look fun. It would look fun okay. and freeing for the most part. Of course, there would be peaks and valleys, but we would have more peaks and valleys, okay. ideally. So what, what do you think brings about harmony in a relationship? The person. Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, the combination of two people. Well, you have to work together. Yeah, yeah. so if I'm bringing my, my bowl of harmony and I'm, I'm working on that daily mm. and she's got her bowl of harmony that she's working on daily and together we mixing that bowl of harmony in a beautiful cake mm-hmm. you know we can eat that batter <laughs> straight out of the bowl <laughs> it doesn't have to go in the oven okay <laughs> <laughs> well what kind of qualities would, the, would a partner like oh, that yeah. have hmm <clears throat> I think the person would have to know themselves. Uh So in knowing oneself, the qualities that emerge would be virtue, Mm. would be virtuous. Mm -hmm. And they would be, have a capacity for self-love and self-care that is on par or very similar to my own capacity to holding that space for self-love and self-care. So we would be two people that have done deep work and who are interested in sharing the journey, but not interested in ownership. So it would be a very freeing relationship because there would be a level of trust. Unlike we've never seen before. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Because we have to completely allow each other to be free, travel here, go there, spend some time with this friends, those friends. And ideally have a monogamy, have some monogamous relationship from that. Hmm. have a monogamous relationship from that. So within that trust of travel and play and dancing, they, these, this person would be monogamous ideally. Mm -hmm. And if not, I could look at that bridge when it comes, you know, I think it could be a bit of our our own ego 
to want to and desire monogamy mm-hmm. because it's very challenging yes. from our ancestors who were very amorous and arduous, I think, in having fun with whatever came across its path. Yeah. Whereas now we have our advantages to staying in a monogamous relationship. Primarily, I feel, is our health. It's nice to know that our partner is safe yes. and not going to bring home something. If, yes. Yeah, if they're monogamous with us. And also, there's a, a just a peace of mind, just knowing that we're co-creating a story together. There's something to be said about that, I feel. So these are the qualities that I think would... Co-creating a story. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's cool. <laughs> so, would you say that that is what you really want, that, that kind of harmonious, monogamous relationship? Mm-hmm. So, somebody you can write a story, create a story with yeah. together. Yeah. That's that's what you really want. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's that's wonderful. It sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, well, it does it. It does cross my mind. Like, I wonder if you you have certain filters that mm. might might stop that coming up. Like, if if you might. Uh, because, like, like you said, you have this higher standard for for a, mm-hmm. a life partner. Would there be something maybe in the early stages that would make you think maybe they're not the right person, and maybe maybe you you judge them too quickly? Is is that a possibility? Yeah, yeah, yeah it is. Yeah, yeah. I met this recent young woman, and we started a relationship uh, quite quickly, but we had had a really excuse me, uh, interesting, powerful event that brought us together. Uh, I guided her through a ceremony with psilocybin and she mm-hmm. went over the deep end mm-hmm. and much like our dear friend with what happened to him, yes. she was having the same. Well, we, yeah. Just to explain that quickly, we had a, a friend who had an in, intense journey last night. and, and uh, A very difficult passage. Yes, yeah. and uh, Antonio helped, helped guide him through that. So. Yeah, so for this other dear friend of mine, I'll well, call Miss K. Miss K went through her own struggle this night with psilocybin. It was like an exorcism for three hours, three and a half hours. She was rolling around screaming, bloody murder. Wow. And I was just so grateful the neighbors didn't call the ambulance or police and, and put a stop to it. So right. that would have been a whole other mess. So yes. fortunately, I was with her and guided her back through the journey. So she came back completely whole, completely well, completely grounded and centered. And she's doing great. But the point being from that relationship, it was such an intense um, opening mm. to who we are and what our capacity is. Mm. We know we saw each other just clearly. There was total transparency. And so from that and then nurturing her and um, allowing her to integrate for the whole next day and being with her, mm-hmm. it created a bond. Mm-hmm. It was a deep connection there. And I initially was rejecting the notion of going into a relationship with her because I just energetically felt that there was something there that wasn't jiving with me. Okay. But she was pursuing me and she was really, really persistent and adamant about being in a relationship with me. Hmm. So eventually I said, well, why not? Hmm. So I gave it (laughs) a shot because I just wanted to see where it was going to go. I said, well, this person has a lot of similar interests, a lot of qualities that I like. There's a a potential for capacity there for self-love and self-care that I thought could mirror my own. So we went into the relationship. So long story short, the relationship ended um, after about three months. But I really was into her. I really thought I could could be with this person. I want want a life partner. And I might have been projecting my own fantasies and ideals of having a life partner and wanting Hmm. that because it's something that if you want so badly you almost you can almost trick yourself into thinking and saying and believing this is the one this is the one that i want to share the path with Hmm. which is what i did because i had very premature judgment about her and then living together after a short period of time was the worst thing is probably is one of the worst things that people can do although it works for some people in a very rare occasion yes but it didn't work for us. Mm. And so living together, we were very much at odds. And on top of that, the coronavirus thing hit and we were living in a shared space, very small quarters. Mm. And it was not comfortable for me. It wasn't comfortable for me, but for her, for whatever reason, she could live with it, mm. which was really ironic for me because I find that most people, if they're living in small quarters, feel confined and just like, hey, you've been in my face too much. I need some <laughs> space. 
So, yeah. so that, yeah. So I just I'm telling you this story because there definitely is some truth that I, I do have a tendency to prejudge, but not in a, in a personal way, mm. more in a broader context of this could be a person that I share the path with. Sure. sure. Yeah. Like discernment, not so much judgment. Right. Yeah, right. Of course. Yeah. 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 But, you know, of course, our discernment needs a lot of fine tuning. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. All, all the time. Yeah. So, okay. So, in that case, it, it sounded like you jumped into things a, a bit too quickly. Right. And, and, yeah. yeah. But it was okay. I mean, we're, we're friends now. Yeah. It was, a, it was a quick life lesson, for, a reminder to me for me to really get clear on what I'm not willing to commit to. Okay. Yeah. And what was it about that situation that you weren't willing to commit to? Well, like I said, this person had brought a lot of anxiety into the relationship hmm. and she didn't handle anxiety well. Okay. It, it was like a short circuit for her. Hmm. And and there was a bit of a clinginess to her that she wanted to constantly jump on me and hold me and hug me and like a puppy dog or a teddy bear, <laughs> which maybe if I was 18 or 19, it would be kind of nice. But yes. at this point it's a little bit suffocating. You know? uh -huh. And so it was, I, I, I just really, I love this person dearly and I have nothing bad to say about her, but I just feel yes. that she and I were not compatible because she was almost like this or basically she was an entitled girl came mm. from very wealthy parents and she got everything she wanted. Mm. And so when life hands her something challenging, she has a hard time accepting that challenge. I see. Depending on the challenge. I mean, there's some things with career and computer work that she can rise to the challenge, no problem. Hmm. But something like taking an SUV up a very narrow hill in San Miguel de Allende, where the cars are coming down and compromising her space. Yeah, she gets compromised like crazy. I mean, she gets anxiety like crazy. And yeah, yeah she almost has a short circuit. So I realized I that this this level of comprehension or within their own internal comprehension of their emotional complex and how they handle stress and anxiety isn't on par with where I'm at and how mm. I handle that. So mm. for me, that was one of the big determining factors in me saying this isn't the right relationship for me because it doesn't make me feel good. <laughs> I don't feel at peace. I don't come back to a space of peace with that intense projection of anxiety and stress with the way she's processing it. Mm. Well, one thing I notice about that, it's like, it sounds like you value from what we we're talking about mm -hmm. before, you value your own independence very highly. And, and it sounds like you, you will probably also value that in a partner. Right. Like you, you want someone who's yeah. very independent. I'd like to mirror that. Yeah. Or have yeah. that person mirror it in me. Hmm. Mm. Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah. All right. So the, the tricky part is, uh, you know, the next part is like, how, how do you get what you want? How do, how do you get that, uh, that relationship that's, that's harmonious where right. you have a, <clears throat> an independent partner who is centered and, and understands her own emotions. Right. Right. Uh, yeah. 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 That is a conundrum. Yes. I think part of it, part of that, uh, conundrum or part of the challenge for me comes from a deep wound that I had at 16 years old. Hmm. So there was an incident that happened when I was about 15, 16 years old. I was at a new school, new kid, new grade. And it was my, uh, I think it was the ninth grade class. And I noticed this beautiful girl in the fall semester of school. Her name was... Not even... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But she happened to... She just had this really classical, beautiful face that I thought was really pure and good. So being the new kid, the new, the new one in town, and being this other... I just never had any filter when it came to wanting to express myself. I never knew about, I never really understood cliques within schools, within high schools and how oh. kids congregate in cliques hmm. and how others are ostracized because they don't fit in. Hmm. I never I really understood that dynamic because I moved around so much and I never got it caught up in these coming of age teen movies. <laughs> so I wrote her this letter, this note about how, basically explaining who I was, what I liked, my interests, 
like movies, what books I liked, what music I liked. It was just really very superficial and basic. Kind of just imagine your 15 year old friend telling you what they liked. And that was about it. Okay. And then I gave it to her. Yeah. And we took some cojones. Yeah. You know, here was like a really nerdy looking kid and going up to this girl and not caring about whether or not she had a boyfriend or her, <laughs> her own circle of friends. You know, I had tunnel vision. I don't know what I was thinking. So I went up to her <laughs> and I handed her the note without saying anything. I think yeah. I just said, I want to give this to you. And she took it. And then that was that. And then same day, fast forward about two hours later. And at this time in high schools, they had one of these bells that would ring notifying students that it was time for them to stop congregating and to head over to class. Yes. And so I heard the bell and I'm about to head over to class and I see this young woman who I gave the note to, I had this little crush on and I see her and she's surrounded by about seven or eight of her high school friends. Mm. And in her hand is the note mm. that I wrote her mm. and she sees me and she points at me and I can see her mouth the words, that's him, that's the guy. As she's pointing to me, letting her friends know that I'm the guy that wrote this note to her and handed it to her. Mm -hmm. And her friends all turned their head at me and it seemed like slow motion. And they all erupted in just the shrill sound of high school girls laughing, mm -hmm. laughing at me. And my heart literally jumped out of my chest and fell on the floor and broke into a thousand pieces. So <laughs> that was one of my deepest traumatic wounds from the opposite sex. Hmm. So from that experience, I started to look at girls or women that were beautiful as an intimidation or as a threat. Yes. And so that has colored my perspective of how to proceed in all of my future relationships because I, instead of going for the classical beauty, I instead go for what's inside. And okay. what's inside doesn't need to reflect outer beauty in the mm. same way mm. for me. So by that I'm saying inner beauty is much more, I resonate and I put more value on inner beauty than external beauty. Okay. Well, that sounds like a, to me, it sounds like a, a positive interpretation of those events. It could. Yes. But what I also see is that there have been a number of beautiful women that have been in my peripheral, orbi yes. orbiting my, my universe, so, so you, to speak. And you disregard them because they're physically beautiful. I tend to. I tend, I tend to overlook them because I think that they're going to humiliate me. or not. I know it's not that they're going to do that, but it's a program that I had because of what happened in my, in my youth. Hmm. So there's a bit of a, it's almost like a warning, like don't allow yourself to get too close or too engaged in this person. And I'll have, I'll be happy to go and have a conversation. But if that, and the conversations often are wonderful, they're stupendous. We have a lot in common and there's a lot of ground that's broken, mm -hmm. but I don't end up following through with those. Hmm. Because I tell myself, no, it's, I'm not going to go there. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be painful or, you know, I create a story. I'm the one who's creating the barriers. I understand that. But yes. I know where they come from. So, okay. Yeah. So if you had to put your beliefs about that or put, put a belief in, mm -hmm. into a sentence, you believe what? What do you believe about beautiful women? Well, I believe a lot of things, but... Yes. <laughs> I, think, I think most of them are negative. <laughs> like okay. one of the first thoughts that, I, that would come from that statement is I believe that beautiful women often believe that they are princesses. Uh -huh. They have a highly I idealized sense of self hmm. that, that they've they're been entitled. Yeah. Yeah. Brats that, or yeah, something that they're like daddy's that. girls you mm. know, okay. entitled princesses. Have you met a, a classically beautiful woman who, who wasn't a daddy's girl or princess or entitled? Yeah. Yeah. What was she like? I don't remember. Okay. Because I didn't get to go very deep with her. Okay. You know, usually it's a conversation, and the conversation is, is deep, it's engaging. There's a lot of banter and laughter back and forth. And it seems like there is some synchronicity there. You know, one of the things that happened after this was I was a chubby teenager. Mm -hmm. And then um, after... In my senior year, I, shred, I shredded all of that baby fat and mm -hmm. my growth spurt kicked in 
And all of a sudden, girls started noticing me. Mm -hmm. And I didn't care mm -hmm. because I felt that I was so wounded because of what had happened to me. From that point, I, I was an angry teenager and, and also in, uh, into my early 20s and mid-20s. Mm -hmm. So I didn't care if women wanted to like me or were interested in me because I wasn't interested in going there with them at that time. I was interested in, in escaping. At that point in my life, I was confronted with some life path choices that I felt were very overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to rebel against my own life's journey or soul's purpose. Mm -hmm. So I spent those years rebelling against these, against my path, my soul's purpose, and also rebelling against myself, as is the best way to put it, because I was rebelling against the idea of getting involved with a beautiful woman, or any woman for that matter, because I had been hurt and I was wounded. So I had to go through my own period of escaping from my hurt and trauma. And then after that escaping period, then I finally was ready to come back and address the wounds. And then, and then when I did, I still wasn't ready or still haven't been feeling confident or feeling secure that I can be with a really beautiful woman. Mm. And my first girlfriend was really beautiful. She could have been a model. and She's still really beautiful. But I don't have an attraction to her. I mean, she might have an attraction to me. I mean, okay. who knows? That's silly. It's arbitrary. But what, what, was the, what was her personality or her character like? My first girlfriend? Yes. She was very loquacious, uh -huh. very jealous, very envious. Okay. And, <laughs> yeah. And she was beautiful. Yes. But she also had a deep wound because she was given up by her mother, who was a drug addict at the time. Wow. And so that sense of abandonment and self-worth diminished really ate at her. And so she felt this, this extreme jealousy and, and envy if I was talking to other girls or if I was even looking, if I had wandering eye. And this was at 17, 18 years old. And so I let that relationship dissolve pretty quick. Hmm. So. Hmm. Well, let's try this. Let's try something. Close your eyes for a moment. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and let's just take a deep breath. Now, let's imagine a woman who is harmonious, who is centered, who understands her own emotions, and who is also very beautiful. What can you tell me about her? Hmm. She's earthy. Hmm. She's spiritual. Hmm. She's easy to laugh. She's got a relaxed sense about her, hmm. a relaxed way about her. She doesn't like to be in stressful environments mm -hmm. or have a lot of unnecessary drama in her life. Mm -hmm. And she's independent, strong, soft, yet nurturing, affectionate, and matriarchal to a certain degree. Hmm. Okay. Like in control of the house? Yeah. Yeah, we can say that. Yeah. Okay. Well, how would you say? Motherly. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's, a, that's an interesting thing. Um... um yeah, I guess our mother set a high standard for for the, the uh, you know for what to expect in a woman. Mm -hmm. What if uh, you you broke away from the the ideal that your mother set? Mm -hmm. what, uh, what what would a woman look like? I don't know. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's try to close your eyes again okay. and let's take another deep breath. Okay. So, let's say, <laughs> I'm trying, trying to think about how we could do this. If I say, don't think about your mother, obviously you're going to think about your mother. Uh, but let's try it anyway. So, let's say you, you meet a woman who is 
sensual and soft and earthy. But she doesn't, she's not like your mother. Mm. What is she like? Not like my mother in what sense? Well, you said you used the word matriarchal. matriarchal. Uh-huh. Yes. And so not like my mother. She That means she wouldn't be nurturing to a great degree. She wouldn't be... She wouldn't be one that would be inclined to cook hmm. dinner often. Okay. She perhaps wouldn't be very tidy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it does sound like maybe there, there's uh, something that, again, very difficult to reconcile. Mm. Because if you, you want someone who's mm, affectionate and, and perhaps motherly, uh, maybe she, she won't be so independent which is something you value, value higher. Right. Do you think there is a contradiction there, or do you think there's a way to resolve the contradiction? What do you think? Yeah. There's Absolutely. a contradiction. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah, people are full of surprises. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. So I don't have, even though I've been describing these conceptualized or idealized women, yes. they're not set in stone. I understand yes. that people come in all shapes and sizes and all types of uh, different emotional qualities hmm. or characteristics. Some which may be more compatible for me and others that may not, just depending on the individual. Hmm. But what I'm also finding is that because I feel that I was raised and brought up in a very loving household, it goes back to this idea that love is different for different people Mm -hmm. based on their role models or based on their loving guardians that they had growing up. Mm -hmm. So I see the world as... It can be very cold, but it can also be a very loving place. Mm -hmm. But what I see mostly is people that are focused on self-desire, selfish, egocentric behaviors which often feeds into their narcissistic desire. So that creates for me, or it doesn't create, but I see this creating relationships that don't seem to hold that same container or capacity of love Hmm. because they're focused on more superficial things, material things, and not so much affection, not so much what we would say here, cariñoso, not not very affectionate, not very nurturing. So this is a dynamic that I see is scarce. This idea to really want to be in a loving relationship as opposed to two people wanting to get together and create some material wealth and, and okay. try to conquer the world or something like that. I do wonder if there's some kind of parallel, like he's describing people who get into narcissistic or superficial mm-hmm. relationships. And before you were, you were saying about when you see a beautiful woman, you might have the idea that, sh- that she's entitled or, or selfish or something. And what do you think about that? What exactly? Okay. <laughs> let, me, let me try to, to, to rephrase mm-hmm. that. Well, I, I'm wondering if maybe you're you're assuming these things about other people just like you assume with with a beautiful woman mm-hmm. you you mm-hmm. assume that that they're trying to get into self uh selfish or superficial relationships right <clears throat> but maybe they actually have very different motivations right what do you think i think a lot of people get into relationships because they have the sense of lack yeah yeah and they look for somebody else to to fill them with yeah. words of love or compliments or sweet nothings in the air. And that fulfills them for a temporary period of time. Yes. But I feel like yes. that's why a lot of people get into relationships. So, but now, now this is a really interesting time that we're in because I feel that people are more aligned with who they are and their authenticity. So that means that they don't want anything less 
than where they're at. They don't want anything superficial. They don't want to um, compromise in any way. Hmm. I don't. At least this is what I see. I see people that they're tired of playing games. They know that mo- a lot of people get into relationships for gameplay. Hmm. Games of the heart, games of the mind, manipulation, and all of that. Yes. And they're more interested now in just either being alone because it takes so much work to sustain a relationship, and most people aren't doing that inner work so that it is a compatible relationship and the workload is lighter when two people have done a lot of inner work. Yes. So I find that a lot of people just would either be alone and flying solo, or they are not willing to to compromise into another relationship that's toxic or devaluing in any way. So that's the challenge, I think, is finding finding somebody who really meshes well. Because I found in my last partner, I found a young woman who I could mesh well, we laughed well, we were on par, on page, intellectually, spiritually, but physically, physically, there wasn't this passion. There wasn't this real fire between us. I mean, she had fire for me, but I really wasn't attracted to her. Hmm. Her body wasn't my body type. And not that I have a body type, but there's some body types that are more into than others. Sure. As we all are, we have sure. preferences. But it, it taught me that, I, and I was thinking in the beginning that, well, maybe this will change as I grow fonder of this person, as I grow more loving for this person, my passion, my emotions will, that fire will naturally grow, but it didn't. Right. So that was a a good lesson that I shouldn't follow a relationship if there isn't that passionate fire between me and the other person, Hmm. because that's one of the laws of attraction is that, that fire when chemicals are just responding and firing on all cylinders. Yeah. The final part of the session is normally about homework. (laughs) <laughs> like about an action plan. Yeah. I have some some ideas of what you could do okay. to to explore the the ideas of, that we're talking about mm-hmm. and hopefully lead lead you to, you know, a better outcome. Mm-hmm. I I I think um yeah, and these are just ideas, so so you know, this is, we're trying to collaborate here. So okay. if you if you think it's not a, a good idea or, or if you think it's something better, you can tell me. Okay. So I wonder if you if you could write out some maybe three pages talking about what you like about your mother, how how your mother is a mm-hmm. is a good person or a good mm-hmm. a good a good she was a good wife or um you know how she treated people well and maybe also about how uh, the the things you didn't like or don't like about her sure the, the things that weren't perfect and I, I think that that might give you a, a clearer view of what to expect in in a romantic partner another thing i i thought of is maybe say if you have a a, a list of uh, say five or ten values, the things that you expect to have in a partner, mm-hmm. and maybe you don't have to have all of them. So if you have, you know, four out of five or eight out of ten, mm-hmm. maybe that person is is good enough. Okay. And maybe they can, you know, you'll grow mm-hmm. together. Okay. Uh, so what do you think about those? Or I like those suggestions. Yeah. I have a question about the list of qualities that I would like in a partner. Yeah. That list can be very short or it can be very long. How long or short would you suggest that list be? <laughs> right. Yeah, well, it's, it, it, <laughs> it sounds like you won't have problems coming up with things to that list. So I'd say start with 10. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah, well, when, when do you think you could uh, do those exercises, by? Uh, probably tonight or tomorrow. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. Yeah. And all right, I'll ask you some some uh some questions. It might okay. seem a bit silly. Okay. But these are like to confirm the the value of taking action. Okay. So uh, <clears throat> one question is who is responsible for, for doing this exercise and this reflection? Who? Yes. 
It's not a trick question. Yes, right. (laughs) (laughs) And who benefits, who receives the benefits from doing these exercises? Well, it would be me and my extended circle of of people in my field. Yes, possibly your future partner. Right, um, right. Any relationships that I encounter, whether romantic or otherwise. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so what are the benefits, uh, especially for you? What are the benefits? Yeah, for doing an exercise, doing reflection like that. Well, clarity Mm. would be one. Yes. It sounds like this would potentially give me clarity into this, an insight into this issue or this conundrum. So, yeah. Clarity, change of perception, perhaps. Yeah, seeing things from a different angle. Yeah. Go like uh, in CBT, we call it cognitive flexibility. Yeah. Being able to see things from different perspectives. Yeah. Which is very valuable. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Yes. Yeah, so that's cool. Uh, yeah, another thing. By well, we're we're beings of limited time and resources. Mm-hmm. So when we're saying yes to one thing, mm-hmm. we're saying no to to other things. So if you say yes to doing this exercise, finding out what what was good and bad about mm-hmm. about your your mother's relationships, and, mm-hmm. and thinking about what you uh, what kind of values or uh, characteristics you want in a partner. Mm-hmm. Uh, what are you saying no to? What uh, what ideas or, or what uh, what actions or what behaviors, what beliefs are you saying no to? I don't know. Okay, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's not a it's not an easy question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's not. Uh, let me see if I can think of an example. So, well, I'd say. In a sense, you'd be, you'd be saying no to ignorance because you'd be ex- exploring yourself and, and gaining uh, self-knowledge. So okay. No to self-ignorance, yes to self-knowledge. Right. Yeah. Can you think of some other examples? So the question that you pose is, if I'm saying yes in this experiment or in this work, yeah. and I'm writing a list down of the attributes that or qualities that I like in my mother that I would associate with a potential future partner, um, well, it's um, or just the attributes that it, that I see in my mother that I like, positive and negative. Yeah. And then if I say yes to this homework, what am I saying no to? Yes. Right. In addition to self self uh, knowledge and self yeah. awareness. Yes to my heart and no hmm. to keeping it potentially closed or blocked. Right. No. To, no. To emotional blockages. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Perhaps no to judgment of others, perhaps. Yeah. 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 I try not to judge others, and we all do to a certain degree. Yes. But I think it it might be a little bit louder than I realize. Hmm. And that's difficult because sometimes I find myself in a place where I really love humanity. I love life. But some days I don't love humanity so much. (laughs) Sure. (laughs) And and that's the challenge because in this line of service and the line of wanting to help and care for myself and others, I have to love humanity. I have to want to help humanity. Yes. And I do. I I deeply do. But maybe, maybe I just need, maybe I just need a a reminder to not be so caught up in the demise or not demise but in, in the lack that humanity seems to have shown as okay. far as the capacity to love and, and care with virtue each other and right. relationships so it's like a, maybe a no to uh, looking at imperfections and yes to look looking at the things that are wonderful about yeah. people yeah yes yeah that's a good way to look at it it's a good yeah. reminder because we all have something good in us that we possess that we can share yes okay all right. Thank, thank, thank you, you, Antonio. Thank you for having the thank courage you. to explore yourself and, and find uh, greater depths of fulfillment. And, and uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Kurt. <laughs> My pleasure. A beautiful thought. Thank you for listening. Now, if you could do me a little favor, that would be really awesome. If you enjoyed this interview, Maybe take 10 seconds just to think, who else would benefit from this? Is there somebody that I know 
who would receive some insight. Maybe this would improve their lives in some way. Maybe broaden their ideas about cognitive behavioral techniques or think about their own life specifically in a different way. Send them a little message, give them the link and tell them, you know, I think this would be interesting to you because, and give them a little reason to listen. Of course, you can find the link to the episode on beautifulpodcast.com. Now, if you, like Antonio, are approaching a crossroads in your life or you have some problem, something you're thinking about, you need some fresh perspective, maybe I can help you with that. So using these cognitive behavioral techniques, we can explore your issue, try to get out that cognitive flexibility that we talked about during the episode so you can see things differently and see those opportunities in your own life. If you want to explore that, head on to beautifulpodcast.com. You see at the top, if you're on your phone, you see those hamburger button and you can press it and it says CBT sessions and you can book a session with me so we can explore that. You'll notice during the episode, a lot of the time putting the putting Antonio in the driver's seat because that's what cognitive behavioral techniques are about building your personal responsibility and personal power so you have more influence over your own life and move it in a direction of fulfillment, happiness, accomplishment, all these wonderful things that are available for you. All you have to do is take a little action so I can help you form that action plan. Beautifulpodcast.com is the website. Happy is the emotion and wonderful is the day. All right, have a good one. I'll talk to you soon. Oh, 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 oh,